Welcome to National Arts. I'm Mike Baker. On this program, we'll visit with Charles Aznavour and Liza Minnelli and find out why their song and dance show has been selling out to audiences both here and abroad. But first, let's drop in on award-winning playwright Wendy Wasserstein, whose Outer Circle Critics award-winning play, The Sisters Rose and Swag, has garnered multiple awards for performance, direction, and production. It's a captivating look at three uncommon women and their struggles with love and self-fulfillment. It's also a deviation of sorts for Wasserstein from her Pulitzer Prize winning play Heidi Chronicles, but is equally entertaining and engaging. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Did you think I'd let Dr. Gorgeous show up for your birthday and not be here? Your sister isn't just coming for my birthday. She's leading the Temple Bethel Sisterhood on a tour of the Crown Jewels. Yes. <laughs> But she managed to plan it in time for your birthday. True. <laughs> You're a good sister, Fanny Rosenzweig. Fanny. God, what an awful name. Why do you keep it? Penny Rosenzweig wasn't any better. Now, Sarah Good, on the other hand, is a great name. <laughs> Multiple divorce is a brilliant thing. It gives you so many names to choose from. <laughs> Wendy, Sarah has this wonderful line in the play which you have given her, where she says that there's a new era now a new era of relationships. Mm -hmm. Does that pretty much sum it up? Gosh, well, I think from Sarah's point of view, I think there's a whole new era of everything because the play taking place, I guess, in um, 89. Uh, no, that's the Heidi Chronicles. <laughs> yeah. Wrong play. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the summer in which it takes place with the fall of the Soviet Union and the sort of, that there's a new world coming or a new world order, I think. And also Sarah's life has been very different as a woman, I think, that... You know, she's a divorced woman. She lives with her daughter. She's the head of a bank. And so her entire life is very different than the life that her mother would have predicted for her, which is interesting in how she sees herself and how she sees men and herself vis-a-vis -vis men. It's very different, if you think about it, than what she was prepared for. Benny, when Jeffrey said he missed men, what did you do? I said I missed them, too. <laughs> Maybe Rita Rosenzweig didn't do so badly by us after all. To Rita. To Rita. To Rita. And her stunningly brilliant daughters. And, and her stunningly, stunningly brilliant, brilliant daughters. daughters. She also says that there's not much unconditional love out there if you want one to have a baby. Right. But I, I, I took it to mean, because you did mention unconditional love so mm -hmm. early on, that each of the characters obviously had certain stipulations that were connected with either loving or being loved. Mm -hmm. So I made my little synopsis, which I mentioned to yes. you before the interview. Fenny says, I'm going to love you if you allow me to be a world traveler. Sarah says, I'll love you if you promise not to smother me and you aren't too interesting. Gorgeous says, I'll love you if you take care of me. Tess says, I'll love you if I can have my own way, of course. And Jeff says, I'll love you if I can be with men. Does that sum it all up? <laughs> sums it all up. I'm trying to think what Mervyn the Furrier would say. He is just, he's your ideal man, isn't he? He's my ideal man for Sarah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's hard. If he was my ideal man, I don't know what kind kind of character he would be within the play. You always think of the other people. I mean, you think of a woman like Sarah and how wonderful it would be if she met Merv or at least that, you know, there should be some <laughs> spontaneous combustion. Uh, that, that old song, Something's Gotta Give. You know that if you put a man like that, that faux furrier, in a room with that woman, something's gotta give. Either way. That's what I tell Jeffrey. And I behaved rather rudely and scared you away. You tend to do that with men? Are you a psychiatrist in addition to a furrier? Uh -uh. Please. Synthetic animal covering. In answer to your question, yes. Some men find me threatening. My daughter tells me that men find her threatening. Uh, of course, when my daughter's not in the Haifa Park, she's a captain in the Israeli army. <laughs> There's this galaxy of relationships that are existing out there. Um, and each person looks to another person for some guidance, or as you refer to it, I think in one article, a heroine of uh -huh. sorts. Uh, Fenny kind of looks to Sarah, I think, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous looks to Rabbi Pearlstein. Yes, she does, <laughs> and to the house of Chanel. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Tesh looks to Fenny, uh, but also anybody that's not a parental type. Yes, think? Is that I, I think that's true. Doing? And Sarah looks to Sarah. She's the most complex. She looks to herself or maybe to her deceased mother, Rita. 
Well, that's interesting because Sarah's the heart of the play in many ways. That's whose story it is. And the point about Sarah is it's not who she's looking to, it's who she's looking away from. Mm. So from Sarah's point of view, what she's looking away from is as strong as what other people are looking to. So she's looking away from her mother. She's looking away from Gorgeous. In a way, she can look towards Fenny because Fenny does it's her baby sister and then you get into what sisters are like so it's all right to, it's safe to look at Fenny but if Fenny changed substantially I don't know how well <laughs> Sarah would like to look at her that's true we learn an awful lot in your play about what each of the characters says about the other mm -hmm. but then there's always the frontal approach where it can be somewhat uh, cataclysmic at times when mm -hmm. you say what you really think especially in a family when everybody uh, doesn't live together all the time and can't make up readily um, you use that approach and it, it brings about a good many laughs but it also brings some pain well one of my favorite things in this play is when gorgeous turns to her sister the banker and her mm. sister the famous writer and says both of you wish you were me <laughs> and, <laughs> and you think in some ways you know she's sort of right yes. <laughs> and in some ways she's insane <laughs> so it's, it's not what she has uh -huh. it's just her whole approach at looking at life yes that, I think so she's referring and to that she feels that about herself I don't think that Sarah or Fenny feel that anyone looks at them and says, gee, I wish I was them. The gorgeous, for some insane reason or whatever, has that feeling about herself, thinks she's just swell. Well, if you ever listen to the radio when you visit your son, you'd know that everyone calls Dr. Gorgeous. Call Dr. Gorgeous, ring, ring, ring. Call Dr. Gorgeous, ring, ring, ring. Hello, I am Dr. Gorgeous. How may I help you? Isn't that great? Isn't that funzy? I just have the best time. <laughs> you bring environment into play here, too, because of where you've actually set the play. It's in Great Britain, and of course, this is a Jewish family. Um, and the character of Tesh uh, makes mm -hmm. reference late in the play about a lack of identity, the fact mm -hmm. that uh, this whole mix of um, of ethnic, religious, as well as environmental factors has, has confused her. Mm -hmm. I would imagine if you look at it as a world community, that probably contributes to a lot of our lack of identity, doesn't it? Yes, I think so. I think now especially there's a whole sense of finding out who one is and a sense of even, you know, nationalism, all of that, looking for an identity. And so much of, I think, of the Jewish identity in the 50s and the 60s was assimilation, was the exact opposite of that. But I think what this play is about is dislocated Americans and dislocated Jews. There's also uh, some throwback here to the whole identity that a, a woman's um, reputation or a woman's, uh, I guess, prestige in the community is tied so closely to that of the man's. Mm -hmm. um, and yet some of your characters have thrown that off, have taken on um, rather high-powered jobs, mm -hmm. and yet they're lonely. So I, I, I begin to question whether you really endorse that or not. I don't know. I think it depends. You know, Gorgeous would sit down and tell you what a wonderful marriage she has. And meanwhile, you know, her husband's typing mysteries in the basement. God knows what that man is doing. Uh, so I think, I think there is a, a loneliness there. But maybe there's the answer, too, that one's entire identity doesn't come from a, a marriage or a relationship. Some wonderful things come from it. And then there's always yourself, too. You're an American Jewish woman living in London working for a Chinese Hong Kong bank who takes her weekends in Poland with a daughter who's running off to Lithuania. And who are you? My knight in shining armor, the furrier who came to dinner? Why won't you give up, Merv? Your women are struggling to find their identity, but one thing is clear, they're not going to measure it on the success of their men. No, I don't think so, even though there's great love there. I think that especially Fanny loves Jeffrey. I think that she has takes great pride in him and has great love for him. I like the fact that you've put uh, the new clarion call in the voice of the youngster in uh -huh. this play, that here we are at the end, and Tess seems to sum it all up, uh -huh. and Fanny actually turns to Tess and says, well, how all of a sudden did you come up with all the answers? Uh-huh. And she's actually chosen, as you've written her in uh -huh. the play, not to go with her boyfriend, right. not to accept his identity, mm -hmm. but to, to find a comfort level of her own. Mm -hmm. So she's the next generation, isn't she? Yeah, she is. And she's very hopeful to me, in the sense, and what she's asking her mother at the end about if we're not American and we're not European. I find that very touching, and that she gets her mother to sing. But there's a real... I think the strength in those women from the generations, from the dead mother to the sisters to Tess, is they're impressive people. 
you know, and you can see it in the in the intelligence of that daughter, and that in a way she's looking for passion. I think her wanting to go to Lithuania is <laughs> <laughs> completely crazy, but but where it comes from, the yearning, the idea of like wanting to care that much about something outside of herself is is a good place, I think. I would like to know you better, Sarah. I think we could spend some pleasant time together. You could meet my children. I already like your Tessie. We're not young, Sarah. And a good man is hard to find. There's something very masculine about Merv and very gentle at the same time that I think is extremely attractive. I mean, that was when, you know, when you sit down to write something, I wanted to write a very nice man. You have a wonderful line that I think defines unconditional love. Mm -hmm. It's a humorous line, albeit. Love is love, gender is bare parts. <laughs> yes. True? Where'd In you come up with that line, Wendy? You know, you always come up from character, really, and I just thought about Jeffrey, and I thought, well, Jeffrey really loved Fanny, and Jeffrey, you know, wants to go back to man, and, you know, as far as he's concerned, you love somebody, and this other stuff is just sort of regardless. When you're, when you're putting a play together and you're trying to, to come up with the, the right, right kind of mix and triangles of characters, how, how do you, do you just write out of your head or do you, do you come up with some sort of a, a diagram? Well, I think about a play for a long time. I don't write that many plays, really. Mm -hmm. So I, I think about it and I think of characters and then I think about, I know with this play I wanted someone like Sarah to turn to a man and say, I love you more than I've ever loved anybody. So I knew there was Sarah and somebody. Mm. And then I was living in England for a while, and I thought, hmm, three sisters in England, that's interesting. And I'm the youngest of three sisters as well. Um, so all of that came in gorgeous. I don't know where she just sprung right <laughs> out of me. The thought that gorgeous is lodged inside of me is a very <laughs> peculiar knowledge. I really thought, where does this woman come from? So There are some similarities, though, uh, among your sisters to that of those in the play, uh -huh. especially as it comes to professional curriculum vitae. Mm -hmm. So I would have to ask you if... If having seen the play, if your sisters didn't at least get a good chuckle out of some of the very basic similarities. Yes, my sister Georgette, whose childhood name was Gorgeous, owns an inn in Vermont. She owns the Wilburton Inn, and she's a wonderful woman. She's the mother of four kids. She is not a talk show hostess or, you know, Dr. Pepper. But I know that the show is going on tour near, near her inn, mm. and she took an ad in the paper. She's taking an ad saying, now that you've seen the show, come on over and meet the real Gorgeous. And I thought, yes. Yeah. <laughs> why not? Why not? Why so, not? It's pretty funny, though. Yeah. Well, that's good that you you gave them that uh, that avenue. Sure. Um, I got about two thirds of the way through the play, mm -hmm. and all this Freudian symbolism began to creep in, and I couldn't help but somehow liken, for example, Sarah to the ego, Fanny to alter ego, and Gorgeous to id, unchecked id. Oh, I think you're much more intelligent than I am. <laughs> Anybody ever come up with that before? I mean, it's, it's just, they're the three parts of the... Of well, the, you know what someone else did intellect. come up with was talking to me about Jews, and they said that um, Sarah was the self-loathing Jew, and Fenny was the wandering Jew, and <laughs> uh, Gorgeous was a practicing Jew. And I thought that's... Interesting. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting. interesting. Yes. And... Uh, it's interesting, gorgeous, that character in many ways is not like my sister, Georgette, it's closer to my memories of my mother, actually, when she was younger, but they're different, you know, always with character, they are all different sides of indeed one person who is the playwright. I mean, the voice of the playwright in this play is Jeffrey, because Jeffrey That's talks true. about art, and you have to make the best plays and the best art and the best theater, and Jeffrey knows who he is when he's inside of a theater. So you can never guess who the author really is. You know, I'm, I'm not a bisexual British theater director. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're Fanny. But, uh, in some to ways, a certain extent, but, you're but Fanny. But that's why Fanny and Jeffrey are the same parts of one person uh -huh. in some ways. There's a connection there between the two of them because they're the two sides of the author. You're hard on yourself about but, taking lapses in writing. Mm -hmm. And you, so you in, imbued Fanny with this characteristic. Yes. Were you, did you consciously do that? I did. I did, because I thought this play was partially me going back to work, too. And I thought, Fenny, we're both going back to work. I remember that uh, when I wrote the Heidi Chronicles, and I, when Heidi had a baby at the end, I thought, Heidi had this baby, and I had this play. And it, at this point, I thought about um, a lot of Jeffrey saying, I know who I am when I'm inside of a theater, and Fenny having to go back to work. 
and we sit together, just us three sisters, around the samovar. <laughs> and we talk about life. And art. Penny. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> that each of us can say at some point that we had a moment of pure, unadulterated happiness. You think that's possible, Sarah? Brief. It was, it was a, a rather a poignant note that was made by one of the characters that all we really want in life is to have a moment of unadulterated <laughs> happiness. That's gorgeous, yeah. It is. They have that in the end, don't they? Yes, they do. In fact, a, a, a theater critic, uh, Peter Felicia, pointed this out to me. We're on a panel, and he asked a similar question. He said, well, they have that moment on that couch, don't they? And I thought, that is a moment of happiness. And I never thought about it when I wrote it, but I thought, that's right. Those three sisters together, because that's the glue. That's what's going to, you know, and they'll, like, an, you know, like when you hit a mercury, they're going to split apart. And go, you know, to Tajikistan in the bank and she'll go back yeah. to Newton and God knows what she's going to do. But there is underlying it all. There's great strength in that family. There's great strength in that affection. You, um, you made a comment in one uh, magazine article that I saw that um, taking into account drama and romance of today as men portray it, mm -hmm. that it isn't altogether accurate and that we need more women playwrights out there. We need more women's film writers out there in order to accurately portray women as they should be seen. A couple of poor examples would be single white female, okay. basic instinct. Well, I think it's also in all these movies, you know, men are always falling in love with women who are 20 years younger than them or whatever, but those movies are, you know, largely produced by, <laughs> directed by, exactly. written by men. So, I mean, what's interesting about this play to me is this is a romance between two 50-year-old people. And people, it's not like people are not buying tickets because they say, boy, Merv falls in love with a 50-year-old woman, you know, I wish if she was 28, I'd go. Mm -hmm. Nobody has said that. People are showing up to this play, you know, and what's really interesting about this play is that men really like it, um, you know, and have, you know, stop me on the street and say, oh, I really love your play. So the whole idea, you know, that notion that it's got to be some hot young thing <laughs> in some way, or that men aren't interested in women's issues and they wouldn't be interested in sisters or whatever isn't true. If you were to pick two playwrights that you admired, I saw that you liked Eugene O'Neill and you also liked um, Chekhov. Yes, well, I would say now. I also admire my contemporaries. I love Chris Durang and Terence McNally and Lanford Wilson, Marsha Norman. I think they're all quite wonderful writers. Are you like August Wilson? Do you uh, yes. write your notes on napkins? He's a I, great napkin person. Yeah, I'm a hand writer. Right. I always write my plays in hand and then type them and then give them to someone to type. Uh, and I love writing in restaurants, too. There's nothing as great as being in rehearsal, especially with Dan Sullivan. And you know, he'll say, we need something, and then I'll go to lunch and start writing, because then you've got the, the actor's voice in your head, and you're thinking about it, and it's, it's, it's great. Deadlines are approaching. As we leave you in this interview, oh. what's next? <laughs> Don't even mention it. I'm sorry. You mentioned it beforehand, so I thought I'd touch oh, on it. God. Is there, oh, God. Oh, God. I mean, are you going to be turning something out within the next 12 months? No. Um, I write a column for Harper's Bazaar. I do that. And uh, actually, I'm involved with doing a new Nutcracker for ABT that Ooh. I've done the libretto for. And my old friend, William Ivy Long's done the set and yeah. costumes. And that's fun. That's great fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a get-rich-quick scheme, but it's <laughs> certainly great fun. And I've always loved dancing yeah. so, and ballet. So it's quite interesting. 